Hello everyone, my name is Ben Eady and I'm the Online Media Manager of ModernAnalyst.com, the premier online community for business analysts. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled The Use Case Technique and Overview. Today's featured speaker is Carl Wiegers with Process Impact and Jeff Lopaka from Corporate Education Group. They have the webinar will last approximately 60 minutes, including the Q&A session. So make sure to submit your questions in advance using the questions feature of the webinar software. I'd also like to say thank you to Corporate Education Group for sponsoring this event. And at this time, I'd like to turn it over to Jeff to get us started. Okay, seem to have some problems hearing Jeff. Hopefully it's not just me. Um, maybe you could uh, start kick it off here. Carl, and we can figure things out from there. All right. Thanks, Ben. Welcome, everybody. And greetings from rainy Portland, Oregon, which is certainly better than the ice and snow and cold that a lot of the country has been experiencing. So I hope you're not trapped on a freeway somewhere like is happening down in Atlanta today. So hopefully uh, Jeff will be back to, to join us a little bit later and uh, can tell you about some of the kinds of services and training offerings offerings that uh, Corporate Education Group provides. We'll have a chance to hear uh, from him a little bit more at the end of the presentation as well. So um, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about um, myself here. I am the principal consultant at a software consulting and training company called Process Impact based here in Portland, Oregon. And uh, I've got on this slide several of the books that I've written. Uh, the one on the right is kind of interesting. That's a, a memoir of life lessons called Pearls from Sand, which I wrote a couple of years ago. It was a lot of fun to write something completely different from my software books, so if that's something you're interested in, feel free to visit pearlsfromsand.com. Uh, you might also want to uh, visit the goodies page at my website. There's a URL there at the bottom of the slide um, where you can download a, a wide variety of templates and useful other useful work aids. And, some of which I will be mentioning here today. Uh, I've been writing a consulting tips and tricks blog for a while, and even if you're not a consultant, there's a lot of good information there about writing and giving presentations and other things. And in many ways, business analysis uh, is a kind of consulting activity, so you might check out the blog there as well. I've been thinking about how to improve requirements practices on software projects for more than 25 years. I became a fan of the use case technique and related methods when I applied it with great success to a project called the chemical tracking system that I worked on at Kodak. So today I want to share with you some of the things I've learned about how this powerful technique can really help uh, people with a wide variety of kinds of projects. Um, let me mention some of the books you might find useful as you want to learn more about this technique. Uh, the first one is the third edition of my book, Software Requirements, which was published just last August. And on this edition, I worked with Joy Beatty of C-Level, uh, a requirements consulting company based in Austin, Texas, um, who provided a, a lot of value. Joy really added a lot and made the book a, a lot better than I could have done on my own. So some of you might be familiar with earlier editions of this book, so I want to point out that the third edition here is really a major enhancement over the second edition. It's about... Uh, uh, 650 pages and a whole lot more content than we had in the first, and I provided a convenient link for you here where you can uh, learn more about that, and who knows, maybe even buy copies for those people who you're still trying to think about what to get them for the holidays. Okay, so, Carl, uh, I'm going to interrupt you really uh, quickly. Sure. I think we've got Jeff back here. If we could have okay. him do his little in thing or intro, and then uh, we'll go from there. Sorry to sure, interrupt. Sure, let's just do that. Great. Can you hear me now? We can, Jeff. Excellent. Oh, fantastic. Thanks. Sorry about that. A little technical glitch there. I couldn't get off mute. Um, but uh, I'll just uh, try to uh, jump in here quickly. I don't want to uh, get Carl off track here, but um, it's obviously we're excited as, at CEG here to be a part of today's webinar with a well-recognized industry expert like Carl. Um, as the president of IBA Boston chapter, I have 15 years working on projects and leadership experience in the BA space, and I recognize and have direct firsthand experience on how challenging the business analyst role can be as well as how highly rewarding it can be when, when things uh, go right. As business practitioners and leaders, staying current on industry best practice and finding the time and the right partners to continue, continue to develop and hone our skills is always on our minds as we manage our careers. Corporate Education Group understands that time is money and usable practical knowledge is priceless in today's nonstop competitive business environment. Uh, CEG's flexible, scalable training solutions 
helps develop consistent skills at both the individual and organizational level in business analysis as well as our other focus areas of business process management, project management, and management and leadership disciplines. We have programs in the three major formats of traditional classroom, virtual classroom, and self-paced online, uh, which helps us to scale both to individual and organizational needs and leverage real-world practitioners that ensure uh, both industry practice and practical best practice are apl app applied back on the job. We have certificates leading to a CEG Duke University, which provides uh, uh, university certificate which provide the professional credibility that comes with training backed by a top 10 U.S. university. And I'll be back at the end of the webinar to share a few more details about business analysis training and exclusive discounts for those who are attending today's webinar. Um, thanks for interrupting the flow, Carl, and I'm pleased to pass it back to you and look forward to learning a few nuggets today myself. No problem. Thanks. I'm glad we were able to get you back online, Jeff. So uh, again, that's a little bit of information about uh, my recent book, Software Requirements 3rd Edition. It does have a very hefty chapter on use cases that I think will provide you a, a good solid overview of the technique. Now there are some special problems with certain aspects of use cases that are, are chronically confusing for people. So I address some of those in my book called More About Software Requirements. It came out a few years ago. So that might also be worth looking at. It helps unravel some of the, the tricky issues, the thorny issues that people sometimes uh, struggle with. Now, a wise man once said, if you read one book on use cases, you're in good shape. If you read two, you're in trouble. And the reason for this is that the writers in the use case field don't all agree on terminology and conventions, although the general concepts are the same. Now, I'm presenting here a, a mainstream approach that's shaped by my own experiences. And the use cases book that I would recommend, if you're going to get just one out of the dozen or so that are out there, is this one, Use Cases, Requirements, and Context, Second Edition by Kulak and Guiney. Uh, I found that to be a, a really helpful book and, and very sensible and practical, so perhaps you will as well. Now, I can't tell you everything there is to know about use cases in this brief presentation, just give you a solid overview of the method. I do have a nice e-learning class called Exploring User Requirements with Use Cases. If you go to processimpact.com, my company website, there's an e-learning page that lists a lot of my training courses that are available, and you'll see the, a description and outline, and you can also go through a complete module from the uh, user, Exploring User Requirements with Use Cases course there. And, uh, you might find that helpful as well. So here's what we're going to talk about today. First of all, I'll give you some definitions about what I think use cases are. Um, I'm also going to uh, tie in some ideas about the very popular technique uh, amongst agile developers of user stories and show you how I see those as being connected. Uh, both of these are taking a usage-centric approach as opposed to a feature-centric approach to software development, which I think is very powerful, and I'll tell you why I think it's powerful. I'm going to talk about the relationship between user classes and actors, one of those topics that uh, often is confusing for people. Describe to you uh, just very briefly how I actually approached a, a workshop with a group of users when I was working on this one project, and, and so on several projects since then, to try to explore use cases and some of the things we learned and the approaches we took there that worked really well for us. Um, I'll show you the pieces of information that make up a well-structured use case uh, in the form of, of a template, and then also tell you a little bit about the connection between use cases and functional requirements, because I think that's another point that causes a lot of confusion for people. Now, I should point out that I am not preaching absolute truth here, but rather uh, just um, sharing some of the things that I have found to be helpful over the years. Now, one thing I've found, and I've been working uh, as a consultant with requirements primarily for uh, many years, and one of the things I found is whenever we start having a discussion about anything related to software requirements, we run into an immediate terminology problem. And that's because people have a lot of different language that they use to describe the various kinds of requirements information we encounter. I could show each of you, there are about 700 people connected at the moment, I could show each of you one requirement statement and you would call it many different things. Someone might say, oh, it's a software requirement, solution requirement, functional requirement, business requirement, user requirement, a feature, a story, um, a constraint. You know, a lot of different things people will use for these terms. So I always have to start by introducing some terminology. So again, this is not absolute truth, 
but I think it's useful. And I want to describe to you briefly here, just to kind of give us a frame of reference for the next 45 minutes or so, uh, a model that I find helpful for getting our heads around some of the different kinds of requirements of information. Now, there's a saying about models. All models are wrong. Some models are useful. And that's absolutely true here. This is by no means you know, complete and, and totally um, perfect, but I think it's helpful. So I like to start at the top with uh, business requirements. Business requirements describe how the world will be better if your product is in it. Well, what is our business motivation for undertaking this project to create whatever it is you're creating, whether it's an internal information system or a commercial product or the next generation of something you already have? What is the business motivation, your business objectives, for even undertaking the project and investing resources in it? And that sets the stage for everything else we do. One place we can capture that information is in a vision and scope document. Sometimes people use other kinds of containers to record this information, like a, a business case or a marketing requirements document or a project charter. That's fine. I'll, I'll, I call it a vision and scope document. But that's nowhere near enough information for a developer to know what to build, so we need to have to go down one other level. And here, the, the solid arrows in this model indicate uh, that information is stored in a particular container. I'm calling them documents, but it could be in any form that you wish to store information. It's just a container. The dashed line indicates that something is derived from or influences other information. So based on our business requirements, we need to go down to the level of user requirements. User requirements talk about things the user has to be able to do with the system. They could be business tasks or, or other sorts of interactions. And these have to align with achieving your business objectives. And a good way to do this, but certainly not the only way, is in the form of use cases. So when I talk about user requirements or a user requirements document, anything like that, I'm really talking about, for, for many projects, not all, using the idea of use cases as a, as a way to get a handle on what it is users need to be able to do with the system. But that's still not enough information for people to be able to go off and build the software. I've seen many cases in which people have uh, written up some even good use cases given them to developers and said, call me when you're done. And the developer said, wait, no, I, I don't have enough information. Don't go yet, even though they had the general idea. So we need to go down to another level, which are the functional requirements. You don't implement business requirements. You don't implement user requirements or use cases. You implement little bits of functionality that let the system do what it needs to do, let the user do what it needs to do, so they can accomplish the tasks they need to and achieve our business outcomes. So a good container in which to store the functional requirements is the software requirement specification. So I think this chain of these three levels is a helpful way to understand that there are different kinds of requirements information with different terms we put in front of them. Well, it gets a little more complicated than that. One of the things that influences a lot of uh, functionality and a lot of what users can do are business rules. Business rules are things like corporate policies, uh, regulations, standards, things like that. And so those influence perhaps who can perform certain use cases or uh, what functionality has to be implemented to comply with, say, security requirements. Uh, we also have a, a whole section of non-functional requirements of which the best known category are quality attributes. These are the so-called illities like usability and portability and installability and many others. And those also are a kind of requirements information that we need to understand and store. We have external interface requirements. How does your system connect to the rest of the universe? And we have de design and implementation constraints that we have to be aware of. So this model illustrates that there are different kinds of requirements information. We don't just talk about the requirements. Let's put some adjectives in front of the word. But today we're going to be focusing on this level of user requirements. Now people often ask me, well, what comes first? Use cases or functional requirements? And in my view, use cases come first. Use cases are a way to understand what users need to do, and then a BA can derive the necessary functional requirements from the use case. And the developers can then implement the functional requirements so that we feel confident that users will be able to do what they need to do with the software. So I hope you'll find uh, this, this structure helpful as we go through the rest of the presentation here. The use case method is, is not new. They were developed in the 80s 
or thereabouts, but people have been reapplying the related technique of user scenarios for many years. So use cases provide an example of a structured technique for eliciting requirements, in this case specifically user requirements, from a group of representative users or other stakeholders. And what we're trying to do is understand what users need to do with the system, what scenarios they envision that they would uh, go through as they interacted with the system to accomplish something uh, of value. Now, I think the worst question a BA can ask during a requirement solicitation discussion is, what do you want? The second worst question is, what are your requirements? Nobody knows how to answer questions like that very well. So what results is you get a wide variety of random but important information that you just have to try to make sense out of and figure out, you know, what do I have here and where do I put it, what do I do with it, that knowledge. So the use cases provide an organizing structure for the requirement solicitation process that I have found very helpful, sort of a top-down thinking uh, as opposed to just collecting a whole bunch of, of pieces and then trying to, to figure out what they mean. So instead of asking people what do you want, let's ask users what they need to do. Tell me a goal you need to accomplish with the system or a business process that the system has to enable you to perform. And that's a whole lot better than asking what you want the system to do, which is the way people sometimes phrase that question to get the discussion started. So I want to shift the focus from discussing features or capabilities the system provides. Let's talk about what people need to do. And a little bit later, I'll tell you why I think this is such a, a powerful technique. So once we have this idea of some of the goals people need to perform, each of which is a candidate use case, then we can pick those that we are confident are in scope for our project, because some of them probably won't be. And then we can have some conversations with users to understand how they envision interacting with the system. Uh, and so in that sense, they're acting, the, the role they are performing is called an actor. Okay? But user or actor is good enough for today. So uh, we're going to explore then a sequence of actor actions and then corresponding system responses, a dialogue that takes place between a user and a system, perhaps with other users or back, background systems participating as well, that together then lead to achieving the goal that the user has in mind. So from that information about how the user envisions interacting with the system to reach a goal, we can derive the necessary functional requirements that can be implemented to let that happen. And this is very significant. I did not think of this the first time I applied the use case technique, but it just jumped right out, right out at me, is that use cases allow us to begin generating conceptual tests very early in the development process. And I cannot stress too much how important I think that is. I think you can start testing your software the moment after you've written your first requirement, whatever form you've written that requirement in. And that's really powerful because by thinking about how you're going to test it, how would you tell if it was implemented correctly or implemented as people envision, you will find a whole lot of errors really early, really cheaply. And, and I think filtering out those kinds of errors, whether they're requirements, omissions, or ambiguities, or whatever, that is a really important thing to do. So these characteristics really help me appreciate the value and power of the use case technique. So let me give you a, a little bit more definition here, a little more formally. Um, here's a uh, kind of a structured definition of what a use case is. A use case describes a sequence of interactions between a system and an external actor, really out of one or more external actors, that results in the actor being able to achieve some outcome of value. And I think that's an important idea, the notion that the user is accomplishing a task that provides value to that particular user. So a use case is literally a case of usage of the system. And this concept of value, keep that in mind, that's important. So a use case should be a standalone activity. You know, the actor or user has some goal in mind, they walk up to the system, they interact with it in the form of a use case, and they achieve the goal. Uh, for example, anytime I'm flying someplace, which happens fairly often, I want to print my boarding pass from from uh, my uh, computer at home before I go to the airport. And so when I log into the airport's or the airline's website, that's the goal I have in mind, print a boarding pass. And that, in fact, is a very good name for a use case, print a boarding pass. And the value that it provides is, is pretty evident to, to me. Um, now, one of the 
things you have to keep in mind is that any system property that does not describe a user goal is not necessarily a use case in itself, even though it's maybe a part of a use case. Um, so it might be a step in that interaction, that dialogue that takes place with the system. Or it could just be another piece of functional knowledge that we're going to have to implement, but it's not describing necessarily a use case in itself. And I'll give you some more examples of this as we go along. Um, another thing use cases describe is the user's view of the system. So we're not talking about technical stuff. We're not talking about architecture or anything like that. We're talking about uh, how the user views their interaction with the system, which is basically a black box. And we're trying to also think about it as a set of task-related activities that are going to accomplish some, some particular goal or, or a task the user needs to perform. Now, one thing to keep in mind, a trap to watch out for, I often see people trying to force fit all of the requirements that they're aware of into a use case. And they'll, they'll say like, okay, well, I need to so select the language for the ATM uh, when I'm interacting with it, so what's the use case for that? Well, that's not, that's not a use case. That's just a piece of functionality that is part of another use case. So don't feel like you need to force fit uh, all functionality into requirements. Uh, or into use cases. I view use cases as a way to reveal or discover or derive the functional requirements. And so if I know about them otherwise, it doesn't necessarily have to fit into a use case. Uh, some people try to package everything together like that. Also keep in mind, a use case is not the only way to represent this requirements knowledge. Um, people sometimes ask me, well, how do you write requirements so users can understand them, but also so that the developers get the details they need? Well, that's hard to do. Often, no single representation of the requirements knowledge will accomplish these diverse goals for multiple audiences. So sometimes you need multiple representations of requirements for the user and the, the more technical views of the system. And this is why I talk about these different containers such as a user requirements document that users absolutely should be able to read, understand, and relate to, and, and critically review, whereas a software requirement specification is targeted more for developers, testers, and other technical people who, um, and then we don't necessarily expect uh, users to review a, requirement, a software requirement specification in detail. So some things that use cases don't do, they don't describe user interface designs. I've seen people try to say, well, okay, here's the use case and here's the screen that goes with it. Well, sometimes that's true, but a lot of times that's too simplistic. You might have multiple screens that a user is going to walk through in, a, in the course of executing a particular multi-step use case. But you also might have certain screens a user could interact with that have oh, many use cases available uh, on them. So there's not a one-to-one -one mapping, and I don't think it's important to get into to specific user interface design when you're understanding a use case. In fact, quite the contrary. I strongly recommend that you don't. If it's helpful to sketch out some, what some screens might look like to help people think through the dialogue and, and the options, great. But let's not get into detailed user interface design while we're understanding use cases. Use cases don't describe technology solutions, infrastructure, and that sort of stuff, and they don't get into application architecture issues. So I don't like, even like to put um, implementation language in a use case like click on OK. You know, that level of specific UI interaction, I'd rather leave that more general. So instead of saying user clicks on OK, why don't we say uh, user submits the data or submits the input? Uh, because there's a lot of ways you might do that these days. It could be by voice or it could be by touch or it could be by click or, or other options. Now, user stories are kind of like use cases, but um, they're not nearly as detailed as use cases are typically written. And it's important to, to rec recognize that you can document your use cases at varying levels of detail. Some might be pretty high level with just broad strokes that people can understand. Others might have to be more highly detailed, whatever is necessary to clearly communicate the necessary information to users, developers, and testers. And that is, our overarching goal with all aspects of requirement specification. Whatever techniques you're using, whatever terms you're using, the goal is clear and effective communication to your various audiences. And I think that's a lot more important to keep in mind than conforming to the purity of any particular method. All right, so here's a few examples of use cases from various sorts of applications. Uh, all right, so I, I have a small business, a one-person consulting company. Uh, which I've had for about 17 or 18 years now. 
and uh, I use QuickBooks from Intuit to handle my accounting. Now, I don't know anything about accounting, but I know that there's accounting things I need to do from time to time. I might have to write a check for uh, something I'm buying or enter a credit card charge. If I provide some service to a, a client, then I have to create an invoice, and maybe they'll pay me, and I have to receive that payment. And these are all good examples of use cases. QuickBooks might call them activities, but, but they're use cases. They're things I need to do in a specific single session with uh, QuickBooks. That's why I went into QuickBooks that day. So these are good examples. Now, if you order something from uh, an online uh, retailer, such as, or an e-tailer like Amazon, they might send you an email that says, yes, we've got your order. Thank you very much for giving us money. And here are some things you can do in the meantime. You can check the status of an order. You can cancel unshipped items, track a package that's in transit, and so forth. So these, again, are all good examples of use cases, things you need to do. And in fact, here's a little tip. When you are exploring use cases, very often use cases answer the question of, um, a user is saying, I want to or I need to be able to uh, do something. So if I was talking to Amazon about uh, uh, what should go into the email, what services should that email provide, I might say, well, I want to check the order status or I need to be able to track the package while it's in transit. So that I need to or I want to be able to, that little phrase gives you a clue that someone is about to tell you about a use case. So speaking of buying a product online, and the, and the little uh, graphic on this slide shows a new customer who's learning how to use a credit card online. You've probably got people in your house who can do that sort of thing. Some of the things you might want to do are to search a catalog, and then if you find what you like, you might place it in your shopping cart, and then maybe you pay for the items in your shopping cart. Now, if these are all things a user could do independently, like the only action in a single session with the application, then they are separate use cases. However, if you could only do some of them together, such as searching the catalog before you can place an item in the shopping cart, in that case, place item in shopping cart would not be a standalone use case. It's not a discrete activity a user would perform. It would be, uh, you know, searching the catalog would be a part of that. So note that there's a, a task-centric or goal-centric perspective for all of these random examples of use cases. And I think that's another thing to, to keep in mind, then, is make sure that the use case is related to accomplishing something that obviously provides value to somebody. One of the few things that all the use case authors do seem to agree on is how to name them. And uh, the, the name should describe a transaction that, that yields value. So we're reflecting the goal that the actor is trying to perform from the actor's perspective. So you, you always want to do it from the actor's perspective. So if you're talking about a, an automated teller machine, you would say withdraw cash, because that's the actor's goal, the actor being the person with an account. You would not say dispense cash, because that's written from the point of view of the system. And I frankly don't care about the point of view of the system. It's not important to me if the system goes away happy after the transaction. It's important that the user goes away happy. So remember, the use case names complete that uh, statement like, I need to be able to, or the system must provide the ability to do something and describe that transaction. You have to be a little careful, though, because you can write names that are so narrow that they just cover a specific kind of interaction, and, and you really want to write them to be general enough to cover a set of related scenarios that um, are all on some common theme. Because otherwise, you can end up with a use case explosion where you uh, end up with a whole bunch of very narrowly named ones, and, and that tells you that uh, we, we haven't phrased them just right. So the typical form in which you write a use case name is got an active verb. They always start with a verb followed by some object. And of course, you can have adjectives and stuff as appropriate. So as an example, we would say to generate a usage report, you would not use a, a title like usage report generation. Always start a use case name with a verb. Look for strong, manly verbs and specific nouns so as not to be too vague or too general. So here are some pretty good examples of use case names, things you might want to do in various settings. Maybe you want to reserve a rental car, or print an invoice, or check flight status. Okay? And then there's also some, some not so good examples. We want to try to avoid fairly weak, generic verbs like enter or something, entering a pin. In fact, enter is not only vague, but it doesn't represent a goal. You don't, no one would go up to an ATM 
enter their PIN, say, thanks, that was great, and walk away satisfied. That's just a step in an interaction for some other use case that's going to be more useful to you, such as you know, withdrawing cash or making a deposit. Um, submit Form 37. Well, if you have 80 forms, you don't really want to have 80 use cases that, that cover all those different forms, which are basically very similar in, in uh, what they're doing. Um, process is another weak verb. Um, process could mean lots of different things. Now, sometimes you have to say, you know, process or manage or something, but a lot of times you can think of a little more specific, a little more precise term that gives the reader a better understanding of what you're talking about. Let me say a few words about uh, agile user stories that you, you often see uh, employed on agile projects. Uh, here's a, a formal definition from uh, one of the experts in the area, Mike Cohn, who says that a, a user story is a short, simple description of a feature told from the perspective of the person who desires the new capability, usually a user or customer of the system. So as employed on agile projects, a user story serves as a placeholder for future conversations that need to take place on a just-in-time basis among developers, customer representatives, and perhaps a business analyst if one is working on the project. So these conversations will reveal the additional information that developers must know to be able to implement that story. Now, rather than specifying functional requirements from the stories, Agile teams typically elaborate a refined user story into a set of acceptance tests that collectively describe the stories conditions of satisfaction. Like I said earlier, thinking about tests at this early stage is an excellent idea for all projects, regardless of their development approach. But those acceptance tests then constitute the details that developers and testers, and for that matter users, will see to make sure they have a rich understanding of the story, user story, so that it can be pro properly implemented. But unlike use cases, user stories typically do not get into user interface or I'm sorry, user interaction specifics about how the user and the system would collaborate to accomplish this outcome. So a popular style for writing user stories these days looks like this, a little template. As a particular type of user, I want to achieve some particular goal so that you know, some good outcome can, can result. So using this user story template provides an advantage over the even shorter use case name because even though they both state the user's goal, the user story also identifies the user class who's interested in achieving that goal and the rationale behind the request for that system capability. These are really valuable additions. So I think it's a richer statement than simply uh, identifying the goal like a use case name typically does. So here's kind of how this works. There's a mystique that's grown up around use cases and another around user stories, but I think, at least at this high level, the use cases look a lot like user stories. So let's look at an example of creating an invoice, something I might do with, uh, actually something I did just uh, this morning with uh, my QuickBooks software. So create an invoice is a good use case name, and a corresponding user story might say, as a small business owner, that's me, I want to create an invoice so that I can bill a customer. Okay? So that's a little bit richer description. So both of these are focused on understanding what different types of users need to accomplish through their interactions with a software system. But the two processes move in different directions from these two similar starting points. So in the case of, of use cases, we will uh, have some conversations with appropriate user representatives and perhaps other subject matter experts, and we'll come up with a use case specification that gives us a rich understanding, at least rich enough understanding of what that use case is all about. And then the analyst would go through two thought processes, and different people ideally would perform this. One is to derive all the necessary functional requirements so developers know what to build. And the second thought process, preferably performed in an entirely separate brain, is to come up with the tests that will be used to determine whether a use case was correctly implemented. Now, why do I say in a separate brain? Because by having two different people go through this thought process from two different angles, one sort for the perspective of saying, what do you need to build? One from the perspective of saying, how do we tell if it was built correctly? We often find ambiguities, gaps in our knowledge, assumptions people are making, and so forth. So I think it's really helpful to create these two representations of the uh, complementary information. 
Uh, and I'll show you a suggested use case template in a few minutes that you might use for recording that kind of a specification. Now, in the case of a user story, we would uh, then use each story as a starting point for conversations to elaborate, refine, perhaps combine or subdivide these stories, and then ultimately leading to a set of acceptance tests that stand in place of those detailed functional requirements. So this is fine from the point of view of, you know, tests constitute one way to think about whether what the details are for the, the story, but you still only have one view. You only have one representation of those details. And any time you only have one representation, you have to trust it. And I think it's a lot better to create two representations, and sometimes even more with models, that you can then compare, because every time I've done that, I have found disconnects and, and errors. So why am I hot on the usage-centric approach as opposed to, to the typical feature-centric approach or product-centric approach that many requirements processes have taken. Well, in general, it's got advantages because we're employing the user's terminology, the terminology of the application domain, which I, I think is uh, much more convenient and comfortable for users than focusing on system features. And the use case approach focuses on user goals. By taking the usage-centric approach, we um, have a, a better way of understanding what requirements then we need to implement to let users get their tasks done. It's really frustrating if you build some software and in good faith and users come and say, well, wait a minute, it doesn't let me do this one thing. Oh, well, um, okay, let's throw in another functional requirement and kind of build it from the bottom up. Thinking about the tasks first helps you avoid that. This also helps analysts better understand the application domain because we're talking about what users need to do. I bet all of you have been on a project that implemented functionality that no one ever used. And I hate that because you spent money and time building that, but it didn't really add value to the project. So we want to try to avoid, with the help of the use case approach, getting a lot of extra requirements that seem like a good idea at the time, but they really aren't important. Uh, again, I stress the value of the early test development. This is uh, something I, I just keep hitting on because it's so powerful, and yet I, I don't see people doing it that often. And also, we could uh, use the use case priorities to help us set implementation priorities on functional requirements. A use case might be of high priority because it's a core function of the system, because it's going to be used frequently or by many users. Maybe it was requested by a favored user class, or perhaps it's required by, for compliance with some business rule, a standard, or a government regulation. And that tells us that the functional requirements associated with that high priority user use case are also uh, pretty high priority. So use cases are appropriate for many, but not all situations. And here I describe some of the types of projects for which use cases are a good tool and others for which they are not so helpful. They work well for the vast majority of end user applications where a human being is interacting with a system or a website to accomplish something. They're good for business automation projects. Probably many of you are working on those. Uh, they're, they're great for website development. What's more interactive than a website? And they're also good for kiosks and, and other devices that users have to interact with, um, such as an ATM or an automated check-in kiosk at the airport, those sorts of things. Um, but they don't work as well for other classes of projects, things like batch processes or real-time systems, computationally intensive systems, business analytics, those kinds of things uh, often don't have a lot of use cases. But the complexity lies with what happens inside the processes or the options available to the user or how the output is presented to users, not with the interactions or the diversity of goals the users are trying to accomplish. Let's look at the real-time case. Uh, sometimes an event response table is a better way to identify user requirements, especially when the user isn't the human being. But here's a good example of a system for which I don't think use cases are, are um, adequate at all for requirement solicitation, and that's a complex highway intersection. I can think of four main use cases. A driver wants to go through a green light, turn right, or turn left for cars. Or a pedestrian wants to cross one of the streets. Those are kind of the main use cases. Sure, a, user, a driver might have to stop at a red light, but that's not their goal. Their goal is to keep going, not to stop, so that's not a use case. So describing that handful of use cases doesn't give the BA or the developer enough information to build the right software. In cases like this, it's more valuable to think about events that take place that the system must respond to, like cameras or other sensors that detect vehicles, buttons that are pressed by pedestrians, timers, and so forth. So uh, use cases are great for many projects, 
but not for all. Now, two terms that come up when you're talking about use cases are the ideas of user classes and actors. User classes are groups of people or even non-human users who receive some kind of services from a system. Actors are roles that those people can play with respect to the system. So they're entities outside the system that interact with it for the purpose of completing some kind of, a, of an event or transaction. So users are real. User classes are real things. Actors are abstractions. And I think of it in terms of a, a stack of hats that, uh, with labels on them that a user could wear. So a particular user might say, at this moment, I need to perform some task with the system. So it, I'm acting in a certain way, and they put on that hat. So sometimes. Um, Members of one user class can perform several different actor roles at various times, so they have this stack of hats. A bank customer is one of several user classes for a banking application. And a bank customer might need to do a variety of things with the system at various times. So from time to time, they might function as an account owner doing account stuff, or a loan applicant, or a depositor putting a check in account that maybe they're not the owner of. Okay, so those are just different actors. Uh, roles that could be performed by members of this user class called bank customer. In other situations, members of multiple user classes could take on the same actor role at various times. For the system called the chemical tracking system that I worked on when I was at Kodak, we had multiple user classes that were permitted to, among other things, request new chemicals from the stockroom. So the system views anyone in any one of those user classes as a chemical requester actor whenever that person is executing a use case to request a chemical. Okay. Now notice that many actor names end in ER or OR, which indicate uh, a clue that someone who's trying to accomplish something with the system. Another set of terms that uh, comes up is the relationship between scenarios and use cases. And a scenario has several meanings. It could be one specific path through a use case that provides several variants. Or it could be a story about a specific instance of a use case execution, perhaps with uh, identifying specific actual users and particular data involved. Okay, so you're, you're getting into a little story about a particular usage of the system. A scenario is less abstract than a use case. So use cases typically encompass multiple scenarios, which could all be success scenarios, or they could be failure scenarios that we need to be aware of and, and be able to handle. Okay, so all of those are, are different portions of uh, use cases. So here's basically how it works. Um, we might have a user with a goal in mind who then uh, approaches the system and finds the, the use case that they're interested in, and they take a particular path through that use case to accomplish the specific goal that they were aiming for. Okay? So often there are multiple scenarios that are parts of a single use case. Let me tell you a little bit about how I actually approached eliciting use cases during workshops on this chemical tracking system. It took us a little while to figure out how to make this work, but it worked well when we did. So the BA and the facilitator worked with several chemists who were the primary user class. We began by asking the chemists to list the tasks they'd need to accomplish with this chemical tracking system, and each of those became a candidate use case. And uh, I set up these flip charts during our, our weekly um, use use case workshops, which only ran two or two and a half hours. You don't go, want to go longer than that because people just get tired and aren't effective. So here we had a use case called view and order. Nothing could be simpler than that. So I put those on the, the flip chart. The big box here represents a flip chart. And then I'd have some information about that. What actor was involved? Well, the requester. And how often did we think people might be using this? Well, we figured maybe five times per user per day. And this gives me some early indications of capacity planning and, and concurrent usage loads. Use cases typically have preconditions that must be satisfied before the user can successfully accomplish or get into the use case even. So the system has to test preconditions. And the preconditions here, uh, we identified a couple. Um, one, the system had to contain orders. It wasn't going to be a very interesting interaction if there weren't any orders in the system. There's nothing to see. And during the course of the discussion, at one point somebody said, you know, I shouldn't be able to see Carl's orders, and Carl shouldn't be able to see my orders. And so we came up with another precondition, which is that the user's identity is verified. Now, that has a lot of implications for the software development, because we know we're going to have to deal with uh, you know, user authentication and, and identifying users with orders and, and logins and stuff like that. So that little precondition has big implications. 
You're not going to think of those all at the beginning of the workshop. They'll come up during the course of the discussion. Use cases also have post conditions, which state what's true uh, at the successful conclusion of the use case. And in this case, we had a very simple one that the order has been shown. All right, so given that framing of the use case, we would then explore the sequence of dialogue elements, the actor inputs and corresponding system responses for each of these use cases. And I would use sticky notes to capture these dialogue fragments on the flip chart. So I might ask uh, the user group, okay, how do you imagine interacting with the system to, uh, to view an order? And someone might say, well, I want to enter the order number I want to see. So I put that on a post-it note and stick it up under the actor actions column. And then as the facilitator, BA, I would say, all right, so what should happen then? And they'd say, well, if it find the or finds the order, then just show me the order details. And we'll go talk about those order details another time. You don't want to talk about that at this point of the discussion, but you want to just get the, the broad strokes here. So we would go through this kind of dialogue until we identified all of the, the normal success scenarios, but also uh, cases in which um, things could go wrong. Like, suppose the user enters an order number, but it doesn't exist. What should happen? Well, we have to say, all right, um, lots of things could happen, but in this case, we're just going to show an or error message that the orders number, order number wasn't found. So we do this for all the normal and exception pathways. An exception is any condition that has the potential of preventing successful conclusion of the use case. Okay, so it's basically an error condition that we have to detect and have some way to handle or recover from if possible. And uh, often we neglect analyzing exceptions when we're doing requirements uh, elicitation uh, to our peril. So what we described there in that first pair of entering the order number and displaying the order details, that's called the normal flow of the use case. The basic flow, the happy path, the main success scenario, it has many names, but it describes the, the basic default typical way this is going to act. And we've seen we have exceptions here as well that we have to deal with. And the third aspect of a scenario or third type of scenario is called an alternative flow. An alternative flow also leads to success, that is, it satisfies the post conditions, but it might take some different path. So when we were having this discussion about this very use case, somebody said, hey, I don't always remember my order number, so I want to see a list of my order number so I can choose it from the list. Okay, so that's still achieving the outcome of showing the order, but it uh, is a different pathway. So that's called an alternative flow. So we have normal flows, alternative flows, and exceptions. So here's what I did then uh, for the, after this, this use case workshop. We do the workshops. I go back and write those up in the form of a, of a template for the use case description I'll show you on the next slide. And then I would start deriving the functional requirements that had to be implemented to make that happen. And I'd start writing them up in a structured form of a bunch of shall statements uh, that describe the functionality going into an SRS, the Software Requirement Specification. And I also start writing the tests that we were going to use to determine if it was implemented correctly. Um, I might draw models, diagrams of uh, various types that would be used to represent the information in a different form. We'd identify any business rules that we were going to have to uh, respect that applied to our, our project. And we'd also start building a data dictionary, a collection of definitions of the, the terms and data elements that we're going to have to be dealing with. So you grow this information. I think of elicitation as a growing process. Now, by having those tests, and an SRS, I can map those against each other and look for these errors and disconnects and gaps and verify the correctness of a, my set of requirements. I can do the same thing with models and test cases. And it's really fascinating to learn how this all works, but we don't have time to talk about it today. So at the end of this project, we had a much better shared vision of what we were going to have when we were done than on any other project I'd ever worked on. And that was pretty exciting. So here's a template that's very helpful for describing use cases of we're not going to go through all this item by item. You can download this template from the goodies page at processimpact.com, where I have various downloads available. And uh, this is described in detail in the third edition of my software requirements book. And as with all templates, modify it to best meet your needs. Um, you don't have to complete all the sections of this template in order, or, or even at all. Start somewhere and fill in the other information as you encounter it. So this template is just a useful structure in which to organize the information you encounter during a use case discussion in a consistent fashion. Um, so simple or familiar use cases could be documented in less detail, 
but more complex, highly risky or novel use cases probably need the full template to really get a rich understanding of them. So let me just quickly walk through a, a very simple sample use case that pretty much everybody has performed. And kind of the classic illustration for use cases is a, an ATM making the withdrawal. And um, that's some of the example I started using a long time ago, really before use cases were that popular. So the name of the use case is to withdraw cash, and the actor is the account owner. That all makes sense. We have a little brief description here where the user withdraws a specific amount of cash from a particular account. Uh, it's a good idea to identify trigger conditions. How does the system know that the user wants to perform a specific use case? You know, the system can't read the user's mind. So we imagine that the account owner has some kind of menu of, of options available, and one of those is to say, hey, I want to make a withdrawal. Some preconditions that need to be satisfied here. Well, obviously, you need to be logged into the ATM so it knows who you are. You have to have an account with money in it, and the ATM has to have money. If the ATM does not know how much money you want, so it may or may not be able to satisfy your request if it's low on cash. But if it has no cash, it should never even let you start the operation because you know you're going to fail. Don't let people start a transaction. If you know at the beginning they cannot complete it successfully, don't waste the user's time. That really irritates me. Now we have some very tangible post conditions here. The user's got their cash. And the account balance is reduced by the amount withdrawn, plus any fees. And business rules would tell us how to calculate those fees. But sometimes you have unobvious post conditions as well, post conditions that the user would never tell you about. No user is ever going to say, oh, and after I've got my $200, make sure you, you keep a record somewhere that you got $200 less in the ATM for the next guy. The user doesn't care about the next guy. The user cares about himself. So don't expect to learn all of these kinds of information from whatever users, end users, you're talking to. Uh, this is high priority because the only reason people put money into a bank is to get money back out of the bank. And the normal flow, here's another thing people who write use cases typically agree on, is written in the form of a numbered list of steps in which you can see the dialogue taking place. So here's how the normal flow might work. First of all, the system displays the user's accounts. And then the account owner selects the desired account from which they want to do the withdrawal. And I like to actually use the name of the actor there, the account owner, rather than just say user or actor. Um, the system then asks the user to choose the amount they want to withdraw from a list of pre-programmed amounts. The account owner chooses one of those amounts. Remember, this is the normal flow, the, the default. The system says, I can do that. I can dispense that cash. And then the account owner takes the account owner takes the money from the dispenser and says, I'm happy. I got my money. Okay? So this is a very simple back and forth dialogue in this case between the actor and the system. But there could, could be several steps that take place from the system. And then the actor does a couple. And so the system or the actor could go first. You know, Every use case has its own particular characteristics. And there might be other actors that are involved as well, maybe behind the scenes. Like if you're at another bank's ATM, it might have to go check with your bank. So that happens behind the scenes, but it's another actor involved in the use case. So the alternative flow here that comes to mind is that at step three, and we want to identify the steps where this could happen from the normal flow, the actor could choose to enter a custom amount instead of using one of the pre-programmed amounts. So you want to describe where this branch in the flow could take place, what happens, and if it rejoins the main flow to continue, how that works. There are a lot of exceptions here we have to worry about. If your ATM only has $20 bills and you ask for $137, I did that once at an ATM just to see what would happen, then it can't fulfill that. So the system should give you a way to try to recover and enter a different amount. There's business rules that dictate how much of your very own money you can get every day. And so that has to be uh, accommodated. If you ask for more money than is in the account, that could be a problem. Or if you ask for more, more money than is in the ATM. And I had that happen to me once, too. So in each case, we want to then indicate the step number in the flow, where the exception could take place, and how the system's supposed to handle it. I know I'm whizzing through a lot of this stuff, but um, we don't have a lot of time today, so I just want to hit some highlights for you. You can always go learn more. So let me talk just a little bit here at the end about this relationship between use cases and functional requirements. And there are really two schools of thought. One says that use cases are the functional requirements. And they regard then, people who, who feel this way regard creating a traditional functional requirements list or software requirements specification. They think that's unnecessary. I think that use cases work better as a tool to reveal the functional requirements. Because I've seen too many organizations get into trouble by relying solely on use cases 
as a way to represent requirements. The developers had a lot of questions because there was a lot of detailed information missing. So the way I look at this is that the, the use cases represent the user's view of the system, and the business analyst must translate that user's view into a set of individual functional requirements, which constitutes the developer's or technical view of the system. Now, maybe you don't want to write these out. Okay, that's up to you as to whether you choose to write down those functional requirements, but I'm telling you that this is what happens, this thought process happens, whether you choose to document that outcome of functional requirements or not. If you don't write them down, then you're relying on the developers to derive all that information correctly on the fly from their interpretation of the use case. Okay, and that, that's a little risky. So the way this might work is uh, you study the different parts of the use case from that template and see what functionality might come out of it. And here's some simple examples. You might look at a precondition and say, the system shall verify that your account is set up for ATM withdrawals, because not all accounts are. Then you look at the steps in the flow, and that's usually pretty straightforward, and maybe you don't need to rewrite these as functional requirements. Uh, but if you chose to, you might write a requirement like the system shall display a list of standard withdrawal amounts. The user shall select one of these amounts or other. You look at the post conditions and see what we have to do. Well, the system shall reduce the total cash remaining in the ATM by the amount of the withdrawal. And we also might study our business rules, and we find that uh, the system shall print the available balance on the receipt unless the account is a business account. From my business account at the bank, I don't get the balance because not all companies have just one person, and not everybody's entitled to see that information. So this process of deriving the functional requirements from the use case is really a high value added activity by the BA. Another reason why I think the use cases and the SRS are, are complementary is because organization, the information is organized quite differently between use cases and uh, an SRS as a set of requirements. And that's a, or a use case has a bunch of little packages of information. You've got preconditions, your list of steps in the normal flow, zero or more alternatives, zero or more exceptions, post conditions, and so forth. And yet, an SRS is organized typically more hierarchically, where the bits and pieces of this use case might get threaded into the SRS in different ways. And I think the SRS organization is more useful for a developer, having spent many years as a developer myself. Uh, in which case, I like to see, for example, the exceptions right in context associated with the things that the system is doing. So that's a little easier way to, uh, for the developer to make sure they have a rich understanding of this instead of asking the developer to go through a use case and then figure out all this information on their own. All right, so we've done a quick tour of use cases here. I hope you've got some ideas uh, about how this might apply more effectively in your world. And really, the reason that we want to focus on uh, user requirements at all during our elicitation process is to reduce the number of unpleasant surprises that happen when we deliver the software that we build. My experience has been that software surprises are, are not good news in those cases, so we'd like to uh, avoid those. So uh, with that, I'd like to hand it back to Jeff, who will tell you a little bit more about the Corporate Education Group. Thank you, Carl. Great presentation. And on behalf of everyone here, thanks so much for sharing these, these great tips and best practices. Um, CG's new online business analysis certificate program takes a deep dive into use cases during the second course as well. And this self-paced on-demand certificate program is ideal for business analysts who want the flexibility to train at their own pace at any location and any time. It offers 60 hours of training and is approved for 60 CDUs with IIBA. And the program has really cool interactive features to keep you engaged. And that includes skill building case studies, live chat with an expert, and valuable job aids to take back to the office. You can check it out in our web-based demo at bit.ly forward slash BA demo. And that uh, URL is also on the slide you're looking at now. If on-demand training isn't right for you, you can also opt for a traditional classroom or virtual instructor-led delivery of the same certificate program. Whatever your preferred method of learning, all of CEG's business analysis certificate programs will help you build the skills you need to succeed and make you stand out among your peers with a certificate backed by a top 10 US university, Duke University. If you don't want a certificate program, be sure to check out our schedule of open enrollment courses at corpedgroup.com. We have a special offer just for webinar attendees today of 20% off the online BA certificate program or an open enrollment registration. Just use promo code MAWEB14 
again, MA Web 14 on the slide you're looking at when registering. The online BA certificate program is great for enterprise-wide deployment as well. If you are looking for corporate on-site training, contact us at info at corpedgroup.com to set up a discovery call with an enterprise account manager and to discuss a solution tailored for you and your organization. Thank you for your time today. I wish you much success for 2014. And I'll pass the mic back to Carl and Ben for some Q&A with whatever time we have left. Okay, Carl. Um, yeah, we're going over a little bit on time, but it's not a big deal. Uh, we can stick around for a few more minutes. Um, so are you okay with that, Carl? Do you have any power commitments that you need to attend to? No, I'm fine. Hey, cool. Stay. Excellent. So let me just queue up a couple of questions here then. Um, let's see. So we have from, from Pam. She says, uh, should we use use cases if we're designing enhancements to existing software that don't involve the user, like automatic term maturity processes? Uh, for something like that that does not involve user interactions, I don't think use cases are likely to be very helpful. Uh, you're talking about just implementing specific functionality. Um, so a, a use case is probably not going to help you discover that functionality. You probably need to use uh, some other method to to try to figure out just what has to be implemented. Uh, that said, use cases can be valuable during um, enhancement projects if you're adding, say, new user visible or user interaction capabilities, uh, like, say, to a, to a website. If you're adding some new functions that uh, tasks that users can perform, then use cases could certainly be helpful for that. But I would say if it's something that only involves systems behind the scenes, probably not, unless you viewed one of those systems as being a user you know, user actors do not have to be human beings. So you might look at it from the point of view of a system that's getting the desired services from other systems. And, and so that could be useful. But in general, if there's no interactions going on or minimal interactions, use cases are not terribly powerful. OK. Um, and sort of related to this, does the use case approach assume or require a person as an actor? Or can it uh, use case? Can it? Ah, let me try this again. Does the use case approach assume or require a person as an actor, or can a case involve just a system as an actor? Yeah, I just touched on that, where, okay. yes, you could You have a system as an actor. Um, the Certainly, you have systems acting as what are called secondary actors behind the scenes that are participating in, in completing a use case. But to think of a, a system as being a primary actor that's getting services and value from another system, yes, that can certainly happen. Um, it's not as common, and depending on the nature of the handshaking and communication going back and forth between the two systems, if that's pretty simple, you know, it's like if it's just a trigger where one system says, okay, go run this report and send me this data, uh, again, the use case system, you, you could do that, but the use case approach is not likely to be powerful. There's a difference between whether you could write use cases to do that and how useful those use cases are actually going to be in terms of helping you discover all the functionality that has to be implemented and, and so forth. So uh, it's doable, but may or may not be helpful. OK. Um, now Steve's asking, could you describe the relative brevity of a use case? Is, um, is this typically a lengthy, detailed card um, because it may encompass multiple scenarios? Or would a use case include trees or paths within the same use case? Uh, usually, you would. Well, the correct answer is it depends. You know, there's all sorts of use cases. Some are very simple. Some are very complex. Some are things you understand pretty well already from, you know, the, the team member's understanding of the business domain. Others are novel or high risk that you need to, to be more careful and thorough about. So there's no generic answer. What you don't want to do is write one use case where the normal flow is written with lots of logic in it, with lots of, well, if this happens, then go over here or do that or branch back. You're not trying to write pseudocode uh, in the normal flow. The normal flow is designed to take the default scenario pretty much straight through with minimal branching and, and handling of errors. And then you use the alternative flows and exceptions to uh, handle all of those other variations as, as perturbations of the normal flow. Um, but a good way to do this, a good way to think about the, the length is to just have some judgment as to how much detail you need. For example, for one use case, you might uh, 
write it out in rich detail in a uh, in the template that I've uh, made available. Uh, in others, you might say, okay, I'm going to write my normal flow, and I'm going to list the alternative flows. I'm going to list the exceptions that could take place, but I'm not going to describe those in detail because it's just not necessary to go that far. So there's a lot of judgment that will come from experience, and by collaborating with your developers to make sure that you're not giving them more or less information than they need to do the right job. Uh, but you'll gain, gain that experience and judgment so that you can figure out when do I need to drill down and, and be real precise and thorough, and when can I just do broader strokes and, and keep the risk of doing the wrong thing acceptably low. So there's no formulaic answer to that question, I'm afraid. Okay. Um, we're going to do about two more questions here. So, um, And for everybody that is asking, there will be um, an archive of the slides presentation and a video recording at modernanalyst.com within a few days. So. Um, do you see any conflict in the employment of use cases and the decision model for business roles? Well, I could see them as being complementary. Uh, I don't think there would be a conflict because if you've got a set of business rules that are affecting use cases, which is typically how it works, is that you know each. In fact, I have a space in the template for business rules where you wouldn't actually put the statement of the business rules there, but you would put a pointer to, you know, where those business rules are found. Uh, but there are often are business rules that influence who can perform certain use cases or uh, details around those, such as the one that says, gee, you can only withdraw a certain amount of money from your own account, you know, four hundred or five hundred dollars a day, that sort of thing. And so, if you have decision or if you have business rules that are being used uh, through a decision process to figure out exactly how uh, something ought to work, then um, uh, I see that as complementary to the use case approach because that'll basically just be a way for, uh, in a specific execution of the use case, for the system to know exactly what it's supposed to do. So I, I don't see those are, are being in conflict or, or the methods not being compatible. Okay, and uh, the last question, can use cases be linked or be helpful in writing the test cases? Absolutely. In fact, I, I think I said that three or four times, that use cases are extremely powerful as a starting point for tests, uh, deriving tests. This helps you start the testing process very early in the project instead of waiting till the software is all built or, or other you know, later stage portions of the project's life cycle. So, uh, and it also is a way to improve your requirements because if you can start with use cases and then have uh, a skilled BA start going through and figuring out, okay, what's all the functionality that's implied by this use case? And then you have a, a skilled tester going with that same starting point and saying, all right, how would I determine if this use case was implemented properly and thinking of all the exceptions being handled and all the other kinds of nefarious things the testers are great at, uh, then you can compare those. And every time I've done that, every time I've taken my functional requirements, got to see my waving my arms in the air here, I've taken my functional requirements, I've taken my tests, and I've mapped those together, I've always found errors. I've found places where I had a test in mind, but there was a functional requirement missing to allow that test to even take place. And so I have to ask myself, is it a valid test or am I missing the requirement? You find places where people interpreted the use case different ways because maybe something was stated a little ambiguously or the terminology could mean more than one thing. And so the test doesn't really map with the thinking in the functional requirements. So by, by doing that very early in the project, you start not only getting a head start on the the uh, testing process, but you find many, many errors in your requirements really cheaply. So yes, I think those go together very nicely. Excellent. Well, thank you, Carl, and thank you, Jeff, for a very informative presentation. Thank you to everyone for attending today's Modern Analyst webinar. I wanted to point out that the webinar, along with the slides, will be archived at modernanalyst.com within a few days. This concludes today's event, and we hope you have a great day. Thanks. Bye-bye.